tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. During the wildest days of the Wild West, a stagecoach massacre shocked the nation and led to the unwarranted persecution of hundreds of Native Americans. Today, some researchers believe the real culprits were an army deserter and a beautiful madam who were looking to steal a fortune. After six years in the minors, Tony Marabella's baseball career was going nowhere fast. Then Tony was stricken by a mysterious seizure and an acute case of amnesia, which inexplicably made him a better ball player than ever. Mesquite, Nevada, 1994. A casino payroll delivery. An inexperienced driver on his first bank run. A perfect setup for a heist. Police believe it may have been an inside job, and no one is above suspicion, not even the victims. In Webster, Texas, a 58-year-old woman was gunned down in a dark, deserted parking lot. Now her daughter is locked in a heated dispute with the man she believes is the prime suspect. Join me for these intriguing cases and more. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. This much is known. Joan Jeffries died alone and scared in a suburban parking lot. The killer shot Joan twice in the head at close range. Her car coasted on its own. Again, the killer fired twice. Both slugs pierced Joan's heart. No one has been charged with the murder of 58-year-old Joan Jeffries. However, her family is convinced they know exactly who killed her, a former business partner named Sam Patel. I think Sam Patel had the motive. I think he had the opportunity. And I think the facts speak for themselves. I did not kill Joan. Um, I had no reason to kill Joan. I had no reason whatsoever. Sam. Hey, Joan. Just the person I want to see. How you doing? Oh, good. Joan it's Jeffries was a clerk at a Houston, Texas aerospace firm. Sure Sam Patel was employed there as a software engineer, but he had far bigger plans. I want to talk to you about a new business I'm getting involved in. It's a private airline shuttle between Houston and Vegas. It would be called Best Aviation, a specialized commuter airline for gamblers. I've got a few investors, but I think I'll need you for public relations. Public relations? Well, what would I do? Well, you can talk to clients, you can talk to the airlines, the casinos. So you're mature, you're experienced, and I trust you. You know, I... I when Sam understand. initially offered this position to my mother, she was, of course, flattered and excited because the money was very good. Now, this file I have set up for all correspondence... In April of 1994, Patel hired Joan part-time to help launch Best Aviation. He also named her to the company's board of directors. Though Patel was married, he and Joan often met at the home of Richie Guillot, Patel's girlfriend at the time. Sam had um, arranged marriage. Um, he had told me that he could not get a divorce, and so we lived as boyfriend and girlfriend. Thank you. Do you guys need anything? I'll be upstairs. Oh, hold on. Thanks. And Joan, look what I got for you. A brand new laptop oh. for your bookkeeping. Patel told Joan that overseas investors would fund Best Aviation in the coming months. It has only one Meanwhile, a top priority was obtaining life insurance on the company's key people. Joan herself was insured for a quarter of a million dollars. The initial idea was presented from the investor group because they wanted assurances that if something happened to one of the 
key people in the organization, that the company could function and that they would recover their investment. I know what she does for a living, and, and basically she's a, a secretary, and uh, I, I can't see that as a key point person. It just didn't, nothing sounded right about that, so. Sam Patel had agreed to pay Joan a monthly salary, but between April and November of 1994, she received only one check. It bounced. Okay. Kelly Walker claims that by the beginning of November, her mother had had enough of Best Aviation and Sam Patel. Sam, I want out. Why, Joan? Because there's no money, Sam. Look, there's, there's money now. When confronted, he became defensive. Sam, and offended and that scared her and it also proved to her that something is wrong I just want out now I understand I understand you're upset I know you're upset Joan never approached me and said that she wanted to leave the business there was a time when she said hey look this isn't working out and I don't like it she did come up and say that and, and the compromise we had come up with was fine you can continue to be part-time um, until you feel comfortable, and we'll go out and get somebody else to work part-time also. Okay? All right. Please. All right. By then, Joan's back wages totaled close to $4,000. Kelly says that two weeks after the confrontation, Patel showed up at her mother's apartment late at night and unannounced. You'll never believe what he just did. He brought the check. You have it? Well, no, I don't have it. He had to take it out and get it copied, but... She said that he had to go get thing. this certified check Xeroxed, which was odd to her and me. Sam? Hi. Look, Joan, I, I try, but I just couldn't find a Xerox machine, and I don't have a car, so I need to use the phone, please. Well, I, I'm on the By Kelly's account, Patel's behavior that night turned from merely odd so to downright suspicious. Kelly, I've got to go. He was on foot that night. Call me right back. Told my mother he was doing okay. computer time at a company right around the block. And his wife was bringing him a rent-a-car. Kelly says that Patel made no further mention of the check, though he inexplicably presented Joan with some unusual gifts. A door alarm and a taser gun. What do I need something like this for? Joan, this is for your protection. Keep it. No, Sam, I'm not comfortable Look, with something like this I'll be like outside waiting for Penny, and if she does not show up, then I want you to give me a ride home. Uh, no, I can't do that. I promised Kelly that I would call her right back. Will you call her, and I'll be outside. When she told me that he mentioned getting into her car, that, I think, was the, the firmest I have ever been with my mother, saying over and over, absolutely not. Do not ever let him in your car. Someone at the door, hold on, Kelly. According to Kelly, Patel came to the door yet a third time. Oh, Kelly, it's Sam. Look, Sam, it's getting late. Go away. Just Look, I'll, I'll see you at work tomorrow. Sam Patel says Kelly Walker is flat out wrong. I had Kelly? never met Joan like that. I had been to her apartment on a couple occasions before, but I never went took two weeks in the manner that Kelly had described to the police. Never, ever. In retrospect, when I think about that night, I truly believe it was a trial run. And I think because I was on the phone, oh, Kelly, it's and Sam. my mother continued to say, Kelly, Sam, it's, it's Sam, I think it, I stopped it that night. Two weeks later, after a business dinner with Sam Patel, Joan Jeffries was murdered. I'm meeting someone here. Oh, there he is right there. Kelly says that her mother was supposed to meet with both Patel and his wife, Penny. Joan expected a check for back wages. She intended to hand over the company files and sever her ties with Best Aviation. So, what are you doing? Fine. Where's Penny? I thought Penny was supposed to yeah, be here I'm sorry she didn't show up because uh, she had to work late, but I'm here. I advised her not to go. You can do this at work. And she thought, well, it'll be okay. It'll be in a public place. I'll have uh, another... Sam Patel insists that Joan had no plans to quit. I asked Joan to meet with me, and I told her we'll meet. 
I can give you the check, you can give me files, we can arrange for our meeting with the investor group for you to be there. And um, that was the purpose of the meeting. Good, um, it's, uh, it's all there. Is great, there? just what yes. I need for the meeting. Good, yes, it's all there. And guess what I have for you? I've got you your check. Is it good? It will be in a few days. See, the money's being The check was post dated to December 9th, the day Patel said he expected the investor's money to be in hand. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we leave? Good. Sam Patel and Joan Jeffries left the restaurant around 10 p.m. Joan would never make it home. Hey, Charlie. Now, best I can tell, a couple of shots to the head, another couple to the chest. By 9 a.m., detectives were beginning to piece together a scenario. Fifth, then I saw this. Can you see that over there? Necklace. Joan's purse and keys were missing, yet her golden diamond necklace was plainly in view. Robbery seemed an unlikely motive. Because of the multiple gunshot wounds to the body, it would make you normally think that the person was angered or it was an overkill type situation, which again would indicate that the offender is known to the victim or, or had a grudge or, or something of that nature. I talked to the detective and I said, well, you know, I know Joan and I was with her last night. And uh, he asked if I wouldn't mind coming in and I was, uh, you know, I decided just to go ahead and go in. There was no reason for me not to talk to them. Could you account for your whereabouts right after leaving the restaurant? What happened? What were your actions? Yeah, uh, we walked out in the parking lot. I spoke to her for 15, 20 minutes in the parking lot. I walked to her car. Um, she went home, and I went to my girlfriend's house. Now, at any time, were you in her car? No, sir, I was never in a car. Are you sure about that? Yes, sir, I'm positive. I've never been in a car, and I was not in the car last night. And the, the first interview that we had with Sam Battelle, he told us that he had not been in uh, Joan Jeffrey's car. Later, in a second interview, he changed his story and said that he had, in fact, been in Joan's car and that we would find uh, evidence of such in, in her car. Now, can you account for your movements after leaving the restaurant? Yes, I, when I went to my girlfriend's house, I rode the bicycle for a few minutes. You rode the bicycle? Uh, yeah, Ron called the sack for a few minutes. I guess your girlfriend will back you up on that. She sure can. What's her name? I opened the door, and the Sam was there business? with a shirt wrapped around his neck. And I said, you know, what are you doing without your shirt on? You're, you know, it's cold out there. You're going to catch a cold. And he said, I've been riding my bicycle. I was hot. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't ridden a bike. I hadn't done any exercise in months and months. And, you know, I, I was going into the house. I took my shirt off. And I had it over me, and I was walking into the house. And that shirt has never been found. And I think it's a very crucial piece of evidence because he would have had to reach across Joan to take the keys out. And that shirt would have had a smear of blood all up the arm. There's no blood stains on it. I have it in my closet. And if whoever wants it, if the Webster Police Department would send me a real nice note saying, please, could we have the shirt? I would be glad to hand over the shirt to them. Investigators say their attempts to obtain the shirt have been unsuccessful. However, early on, they did believe that other evidence could link Patel to the crime scene. I hate to do this to you, buddy, but we got some vomit here that needs to be claimed for evidence. Subsequent analysis revealed the contents, precisely what Sam Patel had consumed during his dinner with Joan. It was lowly evidence, but it promised to break the case wide open if DNA could be extracted from the specimen and if the DNA matched Sam Patel's. But in the end, the lab failed to retrieve any DNA. Though the evidence is inconclusive, Joan's family has no doubts. I think Sam is responsible for the murder of my mother because he had a key man life insurance policy out on her life for $250,000. She was ending her business relationship with him that night. So he needed to do it that night while she was still an employee. Sam Patel continues to maintain his innocence. He insists that his actions after Joan's death prove Kelly's accusations are groundless. The very next day after her death, uh, the board of directors uh, all got together, and we decided that we would take the entire proceeds from the insurance and 
A, either give it to the family, B, donate it to some local charity that would leave a lasting memorial for Joan, or a combination of both. Next, will a mysterious case of amnesia help a young ball player make it to the majors? As soon as I got home and everybody started telling me, this is your house, and this is where you sleep, this is your brother. I can remember my brothers and sisters. My grandfather was with us, I can remember him, and kind of disturbed me, so I didn't feel real comfortable at, uh, at my own house. That's when I started getting scared. Last season, 22-year-old Tony Marabella played third base for the Harrisburg Senators, a double-A team in the Montreal Expos farm system. He bats left throws right and has good speed on the base paths. He also has an extraordinary story to tell. Tony Marabella is a walking, talking medical mystery. Two years ago, his career was on the skids, his dream of playing in the big leagues fading rapidly. Today, all that has changed. Tony may well become the first third baseman to make it to the majors, thanks to a case of acute amnesia. Tony broke into professional baseball in 1989 when he was just 16. Everyone said he was destined to be a star. But by May of 1994, after an assortment of injuries, it looked like Tony was going nowhere. Ironically, a turning point in Tony's career came when he showed up at the ballpark with a headache. I was taking batting practice one day, and the harder my head would hurt, the harder I would try to hit the ball because I was, was getting mad and it was getting worse and worse. And for me, I thought, I, I'm, I just thought if I swing harder or I'll kind of get loose or something, I don't know. And uh, I, get, I took my last one and then I just couldn't take it anymore. I just walked off the batting cage, starting to get dizzy and I fell. Tony, come here. Tony. The team knew Tony was in serious trouble. He was a guy who had always played through every injury. Okay. Oh, he's coming too. Hey, Tony? Tony? Tony, Tony look here. I kind of woke up and saw Tony, like a lot of people. And they started asking me questions. Where do you live, Tony? He's got an apartment in the city, Doc. What were you doing when you fainted, Tony? Do you remember what you were doing when you fainted? And for me, it was everything was like so fast. We're turning, like asking the questions 100 miles an hour and I couldn't comprehend what was going on. I didn't, because I didn't know my name. So I was kind of getting scared. And there was one guy <laughs> answering all the right questions. Batting practice. He just kind of walked back to screen and just kind of keeled over. Okay. I waited until everybody you left, okay? not to be I mean, rude or anything. And I turn around, sure. I don't want to be rude. And I go, but who the hell are you? Come on, Tony, I'm the trainer, man. Trainer for what? And then he told me that he was the trainer for the ball team. Tony. I'm a baseball player. And then I went, oh, baseball player? He goes, yeah, look. And I looked under and I had, I had my baseball uniform. Just take it easy, OK? I go, OK. But then I didn't know if it was a second baseman or third baseman. Take care. A battery of tests failed to reveal any neurological reason for Tony's collapse. It was as if a tiny, invisible bomb had exploded inside Tony's brain, obliterating only his memory. Memory of who we are is the most basic memory that we have. When we separate, you know, as infants from our mothers, we have some basic concept of ourselves. And other amnesic syndromes that can produce loss of memory usually don't involve loss of memory of ourselves. Um, so that was what was quite bizarre. Tony's doctors tried everything to jog his memory. They hoped pictures of his girlfriend would spark a glint of recognition. Now I look at the pictures, and there was a pretty girl in there, so I go, cool, and I was with her. And I go, all right, I got a good-looking girlfriend. But I couldn't remember who she was. I mean, I don't know. In the back, it said Isabel. And uh, I go, okay, I guess her name is Isabel, but I couldn't remember. Tony? Hey! I said, 
Oh my God, I was so worried about you. When Isabel came to visit, Tony pretended to know her. I'm okay, how are you doing? It was like a brand new girlfriend, it's like a blind date. Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, they look like the ones from my garden. Your garden? Yeah, the one you helped me plant. Oh yeah, okay, I remember that, yeah. So. See, I did that a lot, though. Not that I lied to a lot of people, but I said I remembered stuff. I'd go off the bunk, they'd ask me questions. Hey, do you remember this when this happened? And I'd answer, yeah. Just not to have any more questions about it. So that's what I kind of did to her. When no physiological basis was found for Tony's blackout and subsequent amnesia, he and his doctors began searching for another cause. Perhaps Tony's problems stem from the stress and frustration of a failing baseball career. He's in a very competitive situation, trying to make it as a pro player. He apparently was not getting much sleep. He was away from home. Um, he's a young guy that was sort of isolated. And it's possible that things sort of came crashing down on him. And literally, he collapsed. After a three-month layoff, Tony returned to the ball field. It was a best possible therapy. Being around his old teammates suddenly began to trigger his memories. Hey, remember the pitch before that? Right before I hit the home run. Up and well, in. And when it was started out brawl, almost did. Completely. You remember, you remember that? Yeah, I remember that. And it kind of just, I, I just jumped. I goes, oh, yeah, I remember when this happened. And without knowing what I just, and then I realized, hey, remember that? And I remembered the whole thing. Drill it to second oh, yeah. phase. It's, it's the ninth inning. It's ninth the ninth inning. inning. Yeah, it was a beginning of what would become a complete recovery. Incredibly, Tony soon found that his bout with amnesia had one miraculous side effect. He was now playing the best ball of his life. Baseball was so fun. I mean, I would run hard, play dive everywhere, just play like a little kid. When the game was over, I'd go home and wouldn't even think about it. Because for me, it was fun. And that's when my game got better. And it just kept getting better and better because my outlook on baseball and life in general was just so much better than it was before. While there is still no scientific explanation for Tony's amnesia, its effect upon his play is indisputable. A career 250 hitter, Tony began batting at a near 400 clip upon his return. Coming up, a 19th century stagecoach attack has prompted a contemporary debate who was responsible for the Wickenburg Massacre. But first, authorities need your help to track down the key suspect in a brazen payroll robbery. I didn't think that he was gonna leave any witnesses. I really didn't and he had the perfect opportunity to kill us and leave us. Yeah. This man, whom we will call Jim, says he was a victim of an armed robbery in 1994. The FBI, however, has a different take. They consider Jim a suspect. For the past six years, Jim has worked as a security guard at the Virgin River Casino in Mesquite, Nevada. On Thursday, August 25th, 1994, Jim and the assistant cage manager picked up the payroll at the local bank, then headed back to the casino. How's the baby doing? He's doing good. He's sleeping through the night. I've only had two bad nights so far. Oh, well, that's good, that's good. Don't make any sudden moves! Hey. Shut up! Don't say hey. nothing! Don't turn Wait around! Wait a minute! You make any moves and I'm gonna kill this girl next to you. No, calm Just shut up! Don't turn around or I'll kill you, I said. Look straight ahead. All right, all right. I looked to look in the back to the rearview mirror to see, you know, what was going on back there. And so I couldn't see a whole lot, but he did know that I looked back there. And he said if I did that again, he was going to, he was going to blow her brains out right then. And with your left hand, take your gun out and throw it on the ground. Take your walkie-talkie and throw it on the ground, too. Okay. Don't turn around! The robber ordered Jim off the main road and directed him to a deserted area outside town. Well, you know what's going to happen. He's got the motive. He's got everything. He's holding all the cards. Turner, keep your hands up. You're just waiting to catch a bullet, and you can feel it. 
You're just waiting to. But the gunman drove off, leaving both eyewitnesses unharmed. He got away with $220,000 in unmarked $100 bills. From the start, the FBI and local police believed the robbery was most likely an inside job. The gunman was either very lucky or someone tipped him off. Everyone at the casino became a suspect. Not surprisingly, Jim and the assistant cage manager were at the top of the list. Investigators soon discovered that the day of the robbery was marked by a series of atypical circumstances. First, the cage manager and the security chief who ordinarily handled the bank runs were gone. Second, the assistant cage manager decided to make the bank run two hours early. Third, Jim had never before been assigned payroll duty. Finally, the casino hospitality van driven to the bank was not commonly used for payroll runs. So the question came up, how was the robber going to be so sure that this was going to be the day that that van was going to make that run? Too much coincidence. Too many times, too many things fell into place. Too many things happened right in this thing. Somebody, in my opinion, gave him some information. We still had inconsistencies with both of the accounts of the teller and the security officer, things that just didn't make sense. He even asked me at one time, why didn't you slam on the brakes on the vehicle? It's, it's a big van. You know, they don't lock up like they do in the movies. Um, you don't click your radio on like they do in the movies, and uh, everything goes smooth, and everybody hears where you're at and what's going on. Don't talk. There was no way I could reach ahead. over and don't key that mic without moves. him knowing about it. Every time that he saw me trying to get a description of him, he would tell me that he was going to kill us if I did that again, and I didn't want to take that chance. An hour after the robbery, police located the van, abandoned about a mile south of the spot where the gunman had dumped Jim and the assistant cage manager. Jim's gun and radio were missing. Police took plaster casts of footprints and tire prints that indicated the robber had walked from the van to another vehicle and driven away. Despite a thorough investigation, the authorities could not link casino insiders to the robbery. The case stalled. Then the police got lucky. About a month and a half after the crime, uh, the Mesquite police were following a, a simple domestic dispute call uh, in Mesquite, Nevada. Uh, there was a gun involved in the, in the dispute, and it turned out that that gun was, in fact, the security officer's weapon that was stolen during the robbery. The man in the domestic dispute was ruled out as a robbery suspect. The FBI turned to the man who had sold him the gun, Luis Ochoa, the owner of a local pizza parlor. He was nervous and defensive from the very beginning. Mr. Ochoa, would it be okay if we go inside and have a talk here? Actually, it's okay. We, we can talk out here. He didn't want us to come in the pizza shop. We found that a little bit odd. He immediately set our alerts off that he didn't want us to be there and he really didn't want to talk to us. I didn't sell anybody any gun. I don't know nothing about any guns. I don't know nothing about the robbery. I'm in the pizza business, guys. I'm not in the gun business. It was probably a great stroke of luck for us that he kept us outside because we were standing by the pickup truck. We're here doing our investigation. During the month and a half after this robbery, I sat and I looked at this plaster casting of a tire print until my eyes were going to fall out. I knew what the tire print looked like. I looked down at the tires on his truck and they matched. The FBI obtained search warrants. In Ochoa's house, they found $5,000 and $100 bills tucked in the hey, toe guy. of a cowboy boot. Bring me an evidence bag. In Ochoa's truck, they found a bullet, the same kind used in Jim's gun. As the searches were going on, Mr. Ochoa was, in fact, with an attorney, and they were making arrangements to come and meet with myself to discuss Mr. Ochoa's involvement in the case and possibly his accomplices. 
things were starting to unravel very quickly for him. And I think at that point, Luis decided it was time to get out of Dodge. His attorney got word to us that Mr. Ochoa had left his office uh, on a break and had never returned. He was unaware of his whereabouts. And from that point on, we don't know where he is. On a quiet highway, 60 miles from Phoenix, Arizona, stands a small, often overlooked monument, memorializing the victims of a tragic incident from the long ago days of the Wild West. In all, six men lay dead. One had been scalped, another had been dispatched with a lance through his chest. The atrocity would come to be known as the Wickenburg Massacre. Miraculously, two people did survive. Though injured, William Kruger and Molly Shepard lived to tell what would become the official account of the massacre. But did Kruger and Shepard tell the true story? Kruger blamed the attack on the Apaches. The government retaliated, and as a result, scores of innocent Native Americans died. But there is evidence to suggest that Kruger and Shepard were in fact notorious outlaws who orchestrated the attack hoping to pocket a fortune. Today, many believe Kruger and Shepard caused a great injustice to be committed, an injustice that demands to be righted. November 5th, 1871, dawned peacefully giving no indication of what was to come. When William Kruger and Molly Shepard climbed aboard the stage in Wickenburg that morning, they seemed an unlikely pair to change the course of history. Molly was a well-known prostitute and madam who had recently sold her bordello. Kruger was a two-time army deserter who had somehow managed to hire on as a civilian clerk for the military. William Kruger is a wonderful character, just kind of a floater and a gambler and a who all? He didn't have any holdings, he didn't own anything, and was apparently traveling with Molly. From what I know of the story is that it was done by Indians, fewer than 20, and they uh, set up an ambush and just shot the heck out of things. And the two that got away got away because the Indians were on foot. They didn't have horses, so they were unable to chase them down. Well, so this is how it happened. We got into Wickenburg this morning and we switched teams of horses to get fresh horses. The day after the attack, while Molly lay nursing her wounds, Kruger was questioned by Captain Charles Meinhold, who had been assigned to investigate the incident. We started out, and I think it might have been about 9 or 10 o'clock, but don't quote me exactly on that. We started out and everything was just fine. I mean, it was a nice trip and, and everybody was happy. And in fact, everything up to here was fine. It was a, a very pleasant trip. And then, so I believe it was about 11 a.m. or so, that I heard the driver yell, Apaches, Apaches. And the next thing I know, sir, these Indians are firing on us. And, and they got Mr. Loring, you know, the, the famous author? He was up top. They got him and the driver, sir. To, to be honest, they didn't even have a chance up there. And then they wounded uh, Mr. Salmon. It smelled just like the fish, you know? And he got out the back of the coach, and he went running the other way. And these Indians, they, they swooped down on him, sir. They, they swooped down on him, and they scalped him, sir. They, they scalped him there. And it was horrible, sir. And I saw him, and I fired back at him, and, and I got a couple. But that just left me and Mr. Hamill, you know, in, in, the, in the coach itself. And, and, uh, and we did everything we could, but there just wasn't nothing left that we could do. And uh, how was it that you and Miss Shepard were able to escape? Sir, that was only by the grace of God. I mean, poor Molly, she was wounded so badly she couldn't even really run. And Mr. Hamill and I, you know, we were fighting and he was hit so bad that he couldn't go anywhere. And I knew our only chance, our only chance was to just make a run for it. Go, go, Molly, go! And during that split second, Molly and I, we got out the other side and we just took off running in the opposite direction, sir, until we finally got away. 
You say the attackers were Apache? Are you sure of that? Absolutely, sir. It, we were only about 20 or 30 yards from them. I mean, they had on them blue cavalry pants. You know, like, like you got on? You know yes, the kind sir, they I give do. them on the reservation? You know the kind I mean, yes, sir? Yes, sir, I do. Exactly how many attackers were there? Well, sir, I counted at least 15, but you know, there might have been more. 15? Yes, sir, maybe more. Thank you, Mr. Kruger, for your cooperation. Thank you, sir. God bless Lieutenant, you. tell the men we'll ride at sunup. I want to get a look at this site myself. By the time Meinholt reached the site, the bodies of the victims had been returned to Wickenburg for burial. Meinholt uncovered several signs that indicated the Native Americans had been present. Well, Meinholt was a, a military person and looked at it, uh, I guess, like military would. And he really carefully, he studied the footprints, the, the moccasin prints, which they were wearing moccasins, and that most of the moccasin, uh, most of them were towed in, which is typical of the way as a Native Americans walk. The tracks led toward the Camp Date Creek Reservation, 25 miles away. The reservation was home to 750 members of the Yavapai tribe. But curiously, several miles before the tracks reached Camp Date Creek, they veered off in a different direction. This, to me, would indicate possibly a non-Native American group that is heading towards Camp Date Creek to make it look like the perpetrators are heading back to the military reservation. The Yavapai, who were often misidentified as Apaches, were a largely peaceful people. Many worked as laborers and scouts for the settlers. To those who knew them, it seemed inconceivable that the Yavapai would have attacked the stagecoach. It was, it was impossible. It would have been the most bizarre Indian massacre, Native American massacre that ever occurred. There were only six occasions uh, throughout the entire western frontier when American Indians actually, uh, Native Americans, attacked stagecoach. If this was a Native American attack, we would find that the livestock certainly would have been missing. We would have found that the ammunition and the weapons certainly would have been missing. And uh, we would also found that any the blankets would have been taken. But in this particular case, none of it was touched whatsoever. But the most baffling discrepancy centered on several bags of mail that had been loaded onto the stage at Wickenburg. After the attack, most of the letters in the bags were found intact and undisturbed. However, a number of letters addressed to the Army Quartermaster had been opened and their contents carefully reinserted. Uh, you know, the mail, going through the mail, this is something that an Indian, Indian or Native American would not do, is go through the mail. Um, this certainly, you know, to me, would indicate that it was a non-Indian non attack. But if it wasn't the Yavapai, who was it? In those days, gold bullion was often transported by stage. According to at least one account, Mexican bandits disguised as Apaches were responsible. Others point to another, more intriguing possibility. Kruger and Shepard masterminded the entire thing. Uh, it had to be them. If it was bandits, Mexican bandits, or typical highwaymen, uh, why did they let Kruger and Shepard get away? So these Indians, they're slithering up on us like, like vipers coming back to the nest. Kruger's account of his escape seemed hard to believe, especially given the condition of his gun. Kruger's gun supposedly hadn't even been fired. He probably had another gun, or he had switched guns with uh, one of those that was killed which is why he ended up with a gun that hadn't been fired. Jeff Hammond believes that Kruger and Shepard hired the bandits to assist in the heist. Kruger probably fired first to begin with inside the coach, the attacker shooting on the outside. Would have been easy to wipe out anybody inside the stagecoach. They wouldn't have expected somebody inside the coach to start shooting. I think uh, they either meant to wound Shepard to make it look like an actual attack. I mean, Kruger himself has a very slight wound. Molly had a more serious wound, but uh, she may have been willing to do it on purpose, depending on how much money they were getting, or somebody simply got carried away when they were attacking the stage and accidentally hit her. In his report, Captain Meinhold acknowledged rumors that, quote, the scheme was intended to rob the mail of the bullion generally shipped on or shortly after the first of every month. A 
Meinhold made no mention of a gold shipment on the ill-fated stagecoach. There had to be something worthwhile. Uh, whatever it was, it was something that was privately owned. That was the reason it wasn't officially reported. The person that owned the money that was taken was dead. There was nobody left to be upset about it. Jeff Hammond believes that Kruger hid the loot somewhere near the massacre site, where only he and Molly could find it. Kruger had expected to walk out there a few days later and dig it up. Uh, he couldn't. He had no idea that the, this would cause national attention to it. Uh, he knew there was nothing he could do. If he, anybody found him out there outside of Wickenburg digging in the ground, he would have ended up on the other side of a rope. I mean, everybody suspected him anyway, but they couldn't prove it. If there was a treasure, it seems unlikely that William Kruger and Molly Shepard ever recovered it. Molly dropped from sight soon after the incident, and there were rumors that she had died of her wounds. Kruger was last heard from 13 years later, when he sued the government for money he claimed to have lost in the attack. The Wickenburg massacre caused a national outrage. Within 18 months of the attack, the Yavapai were driven out of Camp Date Creek by a government bent on retaliation. Eventually, hundreds of innocent men, women, and children would die from starvation and disease. We may never know who was responsible for the Wickenburg massacre, but there is one undeniable fact. The list of victims stretches far beyond the six men who were gunned down on that tragic fall morning more than a century ago. Join me next time for another fascinating edition of Unsolved Mysteries.